Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very, very accomplished entrepreneur from Toronto, Canada, Mr. John Snell. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, John is the owner and chief executive officer of Elas Tea Company and the NM. TB Consultancy. He has sat on the board of the UST Association and the Ethical Tea Partnership. So, John, before we talk about tea, tell me a little bit about your own journey. Well, my journey uh, has been, I'd say, convoluted and mm. not one planned, uh, which I think is quite common, particularly mm. today. Correct. Um, so, when I left education, I actually joined the armed forces. I was in the Navy for a while. And uh, after serving a short career commission, uh, went into the wide world looking for what was next. Mm -hmm. And tea, I I went to a number of interviews, but a tea company offered me the chance to travel to exotic locations, Mm -hmm. learn about the tea producing, uh, 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 growing and producing industry, and then come back and taste a bunch of teas. I thought, gosh, this sounds like a holiday. Mm -hmm. And I joined and ever since then have been an impassioned tea drinker and a believer in the power of tea to change millions of lives. Um, Yeah. So that was with a large branded CPG company. Uh, And since then, in short, I've worked for private label companies, uh, both here and in the UK, and also for the largest tea importer, exporter company in the world uh, for about half of my career. Mm. And only in the last five years, I, took off the shackles and decided to do my own thing and uh, have enjoying it still. Thank you. Fantastic. Wonderful. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your journey in the, in the tea industry as a veteran of this industry, how have you seen the global tea landscape evolve over the years? And what are some of the key factors driving these changes? Yeah, good question. Uh, the biggest change, I would say, is that when I joined, the uh, actually, I was with Tetley, which is now obviously part of the Tata Group, as you know, um, I would say that tea was simply black tea. Mm-hmm. We were like Henry Ford, you know, you can have anything, Correct. any color you want, as long as it's black. Absolutely. And so that was our focus. Mm-hmm. And the understanding within all CPG companies or within tea companies, I should say, at the time, was that quality really mattered. Mm. And all the quality parameters that consumers looked for were actually those that could be easily translatable into the producer's environment, Mm. and they could actually do something about it. And there was a very close cohesion and um, communication strand from the bottom to the top of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And frankly speaking, Everyone made money. Uh, people were, and consumers were happy with the product. Mm. The largest change, which has really been, I would say, in the last 20 years, has been the change of the definition of tea in the lexicon of the consumer mm-hmm. to include any botanical you, you wish to infuse other than, I'd say, coffee, cocoa, or a few malted beverages. Mm. And that has completely changed the industry from one that was associated to a particular crop was uh, infused with technical knowledge Mm. and everyone knew what was going on because they were frankly speaking dealing with a very simple industry Mm. now you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people involved in the uh, selling of tea who Mm. actually have probably never visited a tea plantation correct uh, let alone any botanical growing Mm. Uh, area Mm. and uh, they are simply accessing uh, finished goods that are available globally Mm. uh, to make a few dollars and that makes it very difficult for the trade to speak as one Mm. and to as a category be cohesive and competitive against others. Quite amazing and when you talk of the Canadian tea market um, what are some of the unique aspects and what uh, differentiates this market from other countries? Well, I think that we could safely say that immigration, which is huge in Canada, a million immigrants last year, which should be 
uh, applauded and welcomed, mm -hmm. um, has completely changed the tea industry here quicker than in many countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the diasporas from very strong tea drinking uh, nations uh, has absolutely accelerated the mm. change in offerings in the marketplace. And we're not just saying, for instance, obviously, uh, we've got a, a lot of Punjabis here and they're black tea drinkers. But we also have uh, a lot of people from Uzbekistan, for instance, a lot of green tea drinkers. Mm. And we also have a lot of Eastern Europeans who are herbal tea drinkers. Mm. So the explosion, if you will, of um, or the proliferation of skews of very different teas mm. reaching the marketplace um, has, is only set to continue in the next uh, in the next decade or so. Amazing. Uh, and when you talk about, you know, when we started our conversation, you were saying, you told me about black tea and how that was the only thing available. But now there are an incredible number of blends available and flavors available. What goes into creating some of these unique flavors that seem to have taken the young by storm? Well, I think, uh, so to be fair, I'd firstly I'd like to say that actually black tea has always been blended. Mm. And um, it's purely because tea is a comfort beverage taken mm. mainly at home. And people will always gravitate back to that which they know. Correct. And so to deliver consistency out of what is a seasonally a seasonal crop in many mm. areas mm. required the blending of many different origins and qualities to achieve that consistency month after month after mm. month. So blending is not new. What is new, as you rightfully mentioned, is the addition of flavors. Correct. So whereas black tea can actually provide a huge number of a variety of flavors, mm -hmm. um, people have gravitated towards the simple solution, which is extracts, be they extracts of bergamot for Earl Grey mm -hmm. through lemon, raspberry, whatever you name, mm -hmm. we, can, we can get there. And so tea has become a carrier for mm -hmm. flavors wow. rather than uh, appreciated for what it is by itself. And that's a danger, I feel, and, and a significant change that people should be aware of as they get into the industry. Mm, very interesting. And, yeah. you know, I keep reading, I'm not a tea expert, but I keep reading that there are a lot of challenges that this industry is facing, um, you know, which could be climate change, labor issues, sustainability. How can a lot of these challenges be addressed? And what are some of these challenges? <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's that's something that keeps me awake at night. Honestly, um, there, there there are many. I would say that the largest, uh, the 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 biggest shift in the structure of the industry at the pro, pro, uh, the production level is that we used to have, and in India, India is a prime example. When in Assam, for instance, you have what they call the organized tea sector. That is, companies that own the factory, own the plantation, and have workers. Uh, employed to pluck the tea, bring it to the factory and produce the tea. Mm. Now what we have is a burgeoning, a, a small grower sector. Mm. And um, really in, in Assam, it was brought about by the old plywood chest tea mm. factories that mm. uh, tea used to be packed into, being converted into what they call bought leaf factories, which was just uh, receiving tea from smallholders. Mm. The difference between those two entities was the social and welfare provision expected under law of the organized sector is not there for the, for the smallholder or bought leaf sector. So the cost of production of the uh, organized sector is some 70% associated with social and welfare, maybe mm. more, and the rest doesn't exist for the bought leaf sector. So what we're seeing is a massive switch of, and it's accelerating quickly mm -hmm. uh, from the organized sector to the smallholder sector. My issue with this isn't that I, I, in some ways it should be uh, it should be uh, accepted. Well, it has to be accepted, but it should be invited in. The trouble is the lack of control over a variety of aspects. And that is that is everything from how do you educate people in uh, to to financial security? How do you ensure that social security uh, welfare provisions Etc. Are, are brought about in a so in a in a smallholder environment, mm. and how do you ensure that the crop that is grown is grown with the consumer in mind with respect to agrochemical use, mm -hmm. you know, which is the maximum residue limits in many consuming countries of tightening 
monthly and which is actually knocking out a lot of tea from the tropics because mm. they can't produce tea without using agrochemicals. Um, but the consumer countries into which they're selling won't accept those MRLs, mm. irrespective of the fact that hardly any of them, if any, make it into the brewed beverage at the end mm. of the day. So this knowledge transfer is becoming harder uh, to make happen, which is going to become a huge issue uh, for the industry. Mm. Uh, climate change, without a doubt, is having an effect. Um, in fact, the incidence of pests mm -hmm. in tea is directly related to climate change. Mm. The warming uh, and the humidification of the environment allows pests to travel further and to grow and breed faster, frankly. Correct. Uh, so this is becoming uh, an issue for nearly every tea origin. Mm. Uh, that, that we can see. Where tea should start to pat itself on the back, frankly, mm. is that out of many crops, tea is actually a very good sequester of carbon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, 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 it is a perennial bush or tree that can sit in the ground for 100 years. Wow. And, um, and the sequestration capability of tea means that of all the beverages that we drink, apart from water, uh, of all the beverages, tea has got the lowest carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm sure that some people can come up with a fantastical explanation as to why Y or Z has a mm. lower uh, thing. But generally speaking, that is the truth mm. because of the carbon sink that the wood and the litter uh, from tea prunings uh, provides to the land. Mm. Fascinating. Fascinating. But, you know, John, I, again, when I was preparing to have a conversation with you, I was reading an article which also raises issues of ethical sourcing and fair trade practices in the industry. How is the industry tackling this? And how are the young consumers who are very conscious about these points, how are they are responding? Yes, it's a very difficult, uh, it's a difficult issue for any uh, soft commodity uh, mm -hmm. industry, frankly, uh, because whilst the tea industry exists in particular geopolitical spheres, most of the uh, most of the issues that exist exist in those geopolitical spheres prior to tea being there mm. and will continue to be there whether tea's there or not. Mm. And and so tea, because it is is there, uh, gets tasked with uh, addressing all these issues. Uh, I do think there's been, in the case of many countries, and I won't name them, I think there's been a devolution of responsibility by governments towards tea because tea is, uh, it is this monoculture and it becomes the only industry within mm. particular tracts of land. So they just say, no, you deal with it. And, and, and there's been a recent case of uh, sexual abuse uh, in a particular East African country. Mm -hmm. um, that is not the tea industry creating that issue this is yeah. these are endemic wrong but endemic mm -hmm. issues mm -hmm. that need to be treated on a much larger scale by everyone mm -hmm. and really the finger pointing and this is a, a, enough issue is that we can't forget that tea in many uh, origins mm -hmm. is a colonial uh is, is part of the colonial past Correct. and and as the political infrastructure tries to move away from that, uh, pointing out that these issues occur within the tea industry helps to further their, uh, their uh, you know, the, 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 the taking apart of those original That's structures. Right. Uh, so, you know, I think that we need to be careful yeah. about mixing politics right. and business in this. I um, completely agree. Yeah. If, 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 I, if I go to the, you mentioned fair trade, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not going to pick on fair trade, but I will mm -hmm. say that certifications are independent bodies mm -hmm. that, also, that are their own marketplace, mm -hmm. frankly. You know, whenever you look at fair trade, Rainforest Alliance, whoever they may be, they mm -hmm. all have their particular bent because they need to have their own uh, unique selling proposition, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly you find tea producers, coffee producers, uh, cocoa producers, with several different um, several different certifications. Mm. But they have not been chosen by the farmers themselves. Okay. They've been chosen by the retailer mm. who buys the finished product. So in my mind, certifications are 
social and welfare colonialism. Mm. Well, so and that and and that actually what you're taking is a generic uh, body of evidence towards what is wrong in particular countries, LDDC or third mm. world countries, mm. and you're applying it carte blanche across all scenarios. And frankly speaking, it's not fit for purpose Correct. Well, in, in, in my mind. Mm. And I think the proof of the pudding is that actually many farmers who have become certified are decertifying mm. because frankly speaking, what do you need to be certified? You need sometimes, ironically, to pay, mm. you know, to pay out before you get back. Right. The get back is not actually guaranteed. It's only if the product that you that you sell is actually sold with that certification on mm. pack. Mm. Uh, many people think that, oh, no, no, that's uh, that's not the case, but that is the case. Correct. So there are other trade bodies. There is the Ethical Tea Partnership, which was started in the UK um, by the large CPG companies. Mm. And if I may be blunt, it was really a risk management policy uh, mm -hmm. set up, but it is a generic uh, and a by the trade for the trade solutioning, mm. uh, which is funded purely by uh, the CPG packers and 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 uh, and other um, and other investors, mm. and they and I do think that that is more relevant and uh, to, to to what's going on t uh, in india there is trust tea yeah. uh which is started by the indian government and again that is if you will uh, by the trade for the trade and so i i welcome those initiatives uh, more than i do certifications mm -hmm. uh, if, if 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 i may the last point mm -hmm. about certifications which i think is dangerous and that is that most consumers if you ask them what a fair trade logo means for them or the rainforest alliance or whom whatever the certification body they will say the certification has been given because the job has been done mm -hmm. whereas in fact the certification stands for the journey has been entered into okay and the and the gap in understanding is mm -hmm. a very dangerous place mm -hmm. one that is um uh, one which is uh, attracts activist media groups mm, to mm. say let's go after certified uh, producers mm. to see what we can find wrong because mm. that is a story if mm. they're not certified then there's no story Correct. so we have to be careful about the understanding and make sure that we uh, we are uh, democratic with our with our descriptions and definitions of these uh, at both ends of the supply chain well said, well said. So time for two or three more questions, John. Sure. My next question is that, you know, now you mentioned a little while ago that tea is primarily consumed at home. But now with the uh, mushrooming of speciality tea shops all over the world, um, how has these shops really impacted the tea industry? And do you think this, is going to, this trend will continue? Well, I think uh, uh, COVID <laughs> did not help that particular initiative. Um, yeah. I think that if we look at there's a there's a very uh, well known brand uh, that was started here in Canada called David's Tea. You can find them on Amazon anywhere you want. And they were a bricks and mortar walk in establishment, and it was amazing to me as a tea man to watch the clientele walking in there. And mainly, they were teenage girls who would walk in there and come out with a uh, with a uh, with a powder blue bag of mm -hmm. teas which they you know in, and the beauty about the bricks and mortar establishment was that all five senses could be engaged mm -hmm. someone could talk to you about the teas could let you smell it could let you taste it feel it touch it see it and therefore and, and that was a very compelling uh, sales pitch if you will mm. um, that during COVID time has moved online and now you can see now what's happened is that only one sense can be engaged and mm. that is yeah what you see and so packaging has become much more important mm. rather than before you could walk into a bricks and mortar store and bring out a, a brown paper bag with tea frankly and it could be great stuff here now you have this vision of what you're going to get and not and what actually uh, comes into your home is not necessarily what you thought it would be. Mm. 
And it has become cheaper for people to get into the trade. And therefore, this this explosion, if you will, of right. brands and available of offerings has happened. And with it, I think there's almost an inverse relationship between that and quality in the and quality. And when I say quality, that's not necessarily just quality of beverage, but quality of the offering in mm. terms of sustainability, social responsibility, uh, terroir, you know, everything is is sort of diluted down no one knows what they're buying or when mm. so that's a that's an issue i think the out of home thing that honestly is is the trick mm. the trouble with tea is that it takes time to brew correct that's the trouble and the and the beauty of tea mm. it's time in which you have to invest in in, mm. in brewing the tea and therefore relaxing and taking the time mm. coffee you know, you can pour it out of a jug yes. and therefore there's no time. A plus it's the sort of get up and go thing. And and it's tailor made for the out of home environment. Mm. What tea has to capture really is the ability to instead of selling five grams of tea or a tea bag for so many cents or paisa or pence, mm -hmm. they have to be able to turn that into dollars <laughs> dollars or pounds or rupees mm. uh, you know a, a, on a, 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 on a regular basis i mean you know when coffee can sell for here in a good coffee shop four to five dollars a cup mm -hmm. and tea is being sold in the supermarket for 10 cents a bag mm. uh you know for the same beverage output um that is the lure and trying to get tea there is 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 it, we are getting there but we're getting there very, very slowly because the need state has mm. not been recognized yet. Correct, correct. Well said. And my last question to you, John, and this is a question which I'm sure you must have thought about a lot. After so many years in the tea industry, as you look ahead, what do you see the future of the tea industry? And what do you think are some of the innovations or trends you see emerging? I do think that the tea trade has a bright future, mm -hmm. but it's going to be disruptive. Mm -hmm. I think that what we are already seeing is a gravitation towards more specialist teas. And there are many fantastical uh, specialties out there mm -hmm. uh, that the majority of consumers have never tasted because CPG companies have directed them towards this, frankly speaking, fairly bland uh, brew, uh, blended beverage, which has taken away those idi of in, of ind the individuality or the, the idiosyncratic nature of certain production techniques. Mm -hmm. What we're now seeing, obviously, online is the ability to, we're seeing Darjeeling producers selling directly to uh, people in the US or wherever. Mm -hmm. and this is going to open people's eyes and palates to the extraordinary variety that tea itself offers. Mm. And that plus a growing focus on the health and wellness that tea, particularly Camellia sinensis tea, and I'm going back to the old definition of tea, mm. Mm. Um, has a has a well documented, scientifically uh, founded uh, reputation as being good for health will stand it in very good stead. Mm. Um, so I do think that's that that's one thing. The second thing that's going to happen is that tea, which is currently grown in, as we say, as a monoculture crop, um, will will start to see the the crop that used to produce only several hundred kilos of tea per he per acre can now produce tens of thousands of kilos per hectare. Mm -hmm. Instead of this just being an efficiency mechanism for CPG and production companies, this now allows you to produce the world's requirement for tea in a smaller amount of land mm. and therefore free farmers up from a monoculture, very risky environment to give up some of their land to other food crops, which I think will uh, hold them in good stead going forward and make it much easier for the rest of us to sleep easy that what we're drinking and sipping is actually being produced sustainably and with the farmer in well mind. Said. Well said. And on that note, John, thank you for talking to me for about the tea industry. I mean, I have, I've actually learned so many new things about a beverage that I really enjoy uh, morning and evening. Thank you for taking me through so many different aspects of tea, through so many challenges the industry faces, through so many of, of the 
ethical um, discussions that people are having and for giving me such great responses. Thank you also for talking to me about the different kinds of teas and what you think as will probably happen in the future. Thank you for speaking to me and good luck to you. Thank you very much indeed for the opportunity. <laughs> Enjoy your chai. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.